So hello and welcome to yet another episode of Top 10s. I'm your interim host, Carl Small, and today we're talking about 10 infamous criminals who got off by using the insanity plea. And as with all the videos here at Top 10s, this one is based on a script written by a member of our writing team, that being Radu Alexander, who you can follow at the social media links below, alongside my own if you want to follow me. Also, you can follow the channel, you can subscribe, you can like. And you might be thinking, why, why are you saying that, Carl, before the video proper? Well, analytics show us that me saying those three things means all three things are more likely to happen. And that earlier in the video I say them, the more likely they are to happen. Also, analytics show us that people at home love videos about people committing crime, which is why I'm wearing my blazer today. So just a little shorthand for if I'm wearing a blazer, we're covering like a slightly more sensitive subject that deals with things like, you know, crime or murder or death. But we know you love that stuff. We know those true crime hounds are out there. So let's get to it. The insanity defense might be popular in fiction, but it's actually used in only about 1% of court cases. And even then, it's only successful in 25% of those. In fact, some US states don't even allow it anymore. But despite all of that, it has worked on occasion, as we're about to discuss. To be clear, we aren't saying these people faked their mental illnesses or passed judgment on whether or not they should have gone to prison. It's just that they were all able to avoid prison time or in some cases a death sentence because they were certified too insane to be responsible for their actions or in some cases even stand trial. And that's kind of interesting. And we're gonna start with an old one here, number 10, Roderick McLean. Queen Victoria was a real diehard gal in the truest sense of the word, having survived no fewer than eight attempts on her life during her long and illustrious reign. By far the most bizarre incident came courtesy of a man called Roderick Maclean, who wanted to kill the Queen because she didn't like his poetry. Hmm, a man responding poorly because a woman rebuffed something he created. Where have I heard that one before? On March 2nd, 1882, the Royal Train arrived at Windsor Rail Station and Maclean was one of the many spectators waiting to see the Queen. But he wanted to do a bit more than shoot a glance her way. See what we did there. As Victoria was making her way across the platform to a waiting carriage, McLean pulled out a revolver and fired at her. The first shot missed and two Eton schoolboys tackled the gunman before he was able to fire again. Yes, two school children tackled him to the ground and saved the Queen's life. McLean stood accused of high treason, the most serious charge in the land, which carries with it a statutory death sentence. However, he had already been medically certified insane just before the assassination attempt. Therefore, the jury only needed a few minutes of deliberation to find him not guilty, but insane. Roderick McLean evaded a date with the hangman's noose, although he spent the rest of his life at Broadmoor Asylum. A short while later, the trial of lunatics acts of 1883 was passed by Parliament, which changed the verdict for future similar cases to guilty, but insane. And something I like to do here at Top 10s is if an item on a script reminds me of something I've covered during my long career online writing fact articles is just give you a bonus fact. So a bonus fact for this entry is that numerous kings and queens throughout England's history have like, you know, had assassination attempts against them. But one of the funniest is at the time Prince Charles, now King Charles, when a guy tried to shoot him, but he fell over and King Charles just watched him. Like he, just, he runs up and he falls over on the stage with a gun in his hand and Prince Charles just looks down and then carries on with his day. Similarly, his mother, Queen Elizabeth II, um, there was an assassination attempt against her while she was riding on her horse and she was somehow able to just regain control of a horse that had just been shot at and just continued along with the parade. Yeah. Anyway, number nine. Jeffrey Arenberg. In 1995, Canadian hockey fans were left stunned when they found out that former NHL player Brian Smith had been killed while leaving the CJOH television station in Ottawa, where he worked as a sports anchor. The killer was one Jeffrey Arenberg, a man with paranoid schizophrenia who believed that broadcast stations were transmitting thoughts into his head. Arenberg had a history of threatening violence against these stations, having previously been convicted of randomly attacking a radio employee for the same reasons. On August 1st, 1995, he went to the CJ OH TV station armed with a 22 caliber rifle. He had no grudge against Smith personally, Arenberg later admitted to as much in court, it, but the sports cast was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. The gunman recognised Smith who was leaving the building and shot him in the head. Arenberg was charged with first degree murder but was found not criminally responsible due to his mental state and placed in a mental care facility instead where he spent the next decade of his life before being released. Number 8. George Roden Everyone remembers the bloody siege at Waco, Texas in 1993 when the ATF, FBI and Texas law enforcement officers surrounded the compound of the Branch Davidson sect led by David Koresh. 
What many people don't know though is that Koresh got the job of cult leader by usurping the previous guy, George Roden. Roden was the son of the man who actually founded the Branch Davidsons, Benjamin Roden, and he lost the position as leader in 1987 following a shootout with Koresh and his followers. He then lost legal ownership of the property due to unpaid taxes, which the Branch Davidsons paid off themselves, who then named Koresh their new head honcho. It's not always easy sailing running cult. Two years later, Roden then murdered his roommate, a man named Wayman David Adair, ostensibly because he believed that Adair had been sent there by Koresh to kill him. Roden was found not guilty by reason of insanity, a common trend in this article as you're about to find out, and spent the final years of his life in several mental hospitals. In 1998, Roden actually escaped from the Big Spring State Hospital in Texas, but was found by the side of the road a few days later, likely dead of a heart attack. Or maybe Koresh just came and finished the job. We'll never know. That's that's a joke. That's that's me making a in very poor taste joke, but he was a cult leader. So it's fine. Number seven, James Hatfield. Just to preempt a few comments here, we're not talking about James Hetfield, the lead singer of Metallica. He just murdered, like, you no know, Saint Anger. But James Hadfield, the guy who tried to kill King George III in the 1800. A former dragoon of the British Army, Hadfield has sustained multiple head injuries while fighting in the War of the First Coalition against France. After that, he began to suffer from various delusions, including that he was the true King George, that he was the biblical character Adam, although he was even a supreme being. As to why he wanted to kill the king specifically, Hadfield believed that his own death would save the world, but that it couldn't be done by his own hand. Therefore, killing the king would ensure a swift meeting with the executioner's block. His foolproof plan failed on two accounts. First, he didn't actually manage to kill the king. George III attended a show at the Theatre Royal. Hadfield shot at him in the royal box, but missed and was quickly tackled by the crowd. Second, he was not sentenced to death. Hadfield was defended by one of the best lawyers in the land, Thomas Erksine, the future Lord High Chancellor of Great Britain who successfully used the insanity defense for his client and got him a permanent stay at Bedlam instead. This is like, that's like Mr. Incredible, isn't it? Just like tackles the guy mid-suicide attempt and he gets sued. It's like, my client wanted to kill himself, you see. So you stopped him from doing that, so we're going to sue the hell out of you. Number six, Isola Curry. Ten years before Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated by James Earl Ray, the civil rights activist survived another quite brazen attempt on his life at the hands of a woman named Isola Curry. And yes, we might as well mention the first thing people probably notice whenever they hear about Isola Curry, because it's probably a picture of her on screen right now. Curry was black, and we should know that her animosity towards Dr. King and the NAACP, or the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People, had nothing to do with race. Instead, she was a paranoid schizophrenic, are you noticing a trend, who suffered delusions that King and other civil civil rights groups like his all banded against her specifically to cost her jobs and that they were, in her own words, mixed up with the communists. It's always those damn communists. On September 20th, 1958, the 42 year old Curry dutifully waited in line at the Bloomstein's department store in Harlem where King was doing a book signing. When she approached him, she stabbed the civil rights leader in the chest with a seven inch letter opener. She also actually had a gun on her person in case the blade didn't get the job done, but she was tackled to the ground before she could finish the job. King was rushed to hospital where doctors managed to save his life. The tip of the blade was actually resting very much on his aorta and one cough or sneeze or slight nudge could have caused him to bleed out. As for Curry, she was found not fit to stand trial and committed to the Mateo Wan State Hospital for the criminally insane. Number five, Richard Dad. Most people remember the Victorian era artist Richard Dadd for his many paintings, particularly the ones involving fairies. However, many of those people might not be aware that Dadd did most of his work while incarcerated in two of England's most notorious mental institutions, Bedlam and Broadmoor, which we've already mentioned in this video. His problems started in 1842 when the 25 year old Dadd embarked on a grand tour of Europe in the Middle East, and while in Egypt, he suffered a personality change, which at first was attributed to sunstroke. However, Dadd eventually developed a delusion that he was the son of Osiris and that his actual father must have been some kind of demonic imposter. So back in England, dad murdered his own dad as the two went on a walk together. He tried to flee to France but was arrested in Paris after assaulting another man and sent back to England. Presumably he thought he was like, you know, set in disguise or something. Dad was certified as a criminal lunatic and evaded a death sentence. Instead, he was committed to a psychiatric hospital where he spent the next four decades of his life, quietly painting the paintings that we presumably put as pictures throughout this video. Also, just the fact that a guy called Dad killed his dad and his name was Richard Dad, so Dick Dad killed his dad, which is not the title. That's what I would have used if I was like um, uh, 
um, picking the names of the subsections. This oh, that time Dick Dad killed his dad. And that's why I work in front of the camera instead of behind the camera now. I'm sorry. Number four, Law Affair. The case of Law Affair was a highly publicised and controversial one because it had a lot of elements that shocked the 19th century Americans whenever they were brought up in public. Women's rights, mental illness, extramarital affairs, and even menstruation. We all know those true crime buffs out there are also salivating, like chomping at the bit to hear about this one. Like, we know you love like to get your teeth into a nice juicy crime story so let's get to it shall we so on the surface this looked like a standard tale of a jilted lover on november 3rd 1870 the 33 year old laura fair boarded a san francisco ferry and shot her married paramour lawyer alexander crittenden after finding out that he intended to leave town with his family instead of divorcing his wife and running away with her and marrying her as he promised her trial became somewhat of a media sensation her defense team claimed the shooting was the result of temporary insanity brought on by i am not making this up a severely painful menstrual cycle they even brought in medical experts to testify but the jury was more swayed by the prosecution who portrayed fair as an immoral woman and a home wrecker they found her guilty and sentenced her to hang however this is where that lovely twist people like in crime stories like this occurred because with the help of several prominent suffragettes who took up Laura Fair's cause, her lawyers successfully appealed and got the first trial thrown out on the grounds the way that the prosecution had portrayed their client had prejudiced the jury. The second trial went in her favour as the jury found her innocent and Laura Fair became a free woman, one of the few people on this list who did not end up in a mental institution or prison and instead was allowed to walk free. Number 3. Daniel Sickles Daniel Sickles was a major general in the Civil War, later serving as a member of Congress and ambassador to Spain. But before all of that, Sickles was also the first American to successfully use the temporary insanity defense when he killed his wife's lover in broad daylight across the street from the White House. Sickles' wife, Teresa, was having an affair with a lawyer named Philip Barton Key II, the son of Francis Scott Key. You might be thinking, well, why are you saying that guy's name like we should know who he is? He, he wrote the Star Spangled Banner. Then, on February 27th, 1859, Sickles approached Key in Lafayette Square and shot him three times. Key died a short while later, while Sickles surrendered peacefully to the authorities. The case seemed like a pretty open-shut, slam-dunk one. After all, Sickles confessed to the deed and plenty of people saw him do it. However, his top-notch defence team had other ideas. They not only successfully argued that Sickles went temporarily mad upon discovering the affair, but that he acted in a justified manner to protect his wife's honour. As his lawyer put it, the death of Key was a cheap sacrifice to save one mother from the horrible fate. As it turned out, the jury agreed. They returned a verdict of not guilty after only an hour of deliberation to the raucous cheers of the courtroom, who were all now firmly on Sickles' side. Number two, John Hinckley Jr. John Hinckley Jr. earned worldwide notoriety on March 30th, 1981, when he tried to assassinate President Ronald Reagan. He ended up wounding Reagan and three other men before being restrained and then attacked by onlookers. And just a little bonus fact about this one, supposedly Reagan was still conscious when he got to the hospital and when he was being like, you know, prepped for surgery, he said, uh, oh, I hope you guys are Republicans, to which the doctor responded, Mr. President, today we're all Republicans. The reason for his actions seemed to be an obsession with the movie Taxi Driver, specifically its young star, Jodie Foster. Hinckley had started acting like the protagonist Travis Bickle, played by Robert De Niro, talking like him, dressing like him, writing a diary like him, and developing a fascination with guns. Now, I'm not saying teaching media literacy would have stopped this, but I am saying that basic media literacy would have helped this guy realise that Travis Bickle is not a character to be emulated. Same with like, you know, Fight Club, all those movies. Just, just, a, just, just a little bit of self-awareness. You look at Travis Bickle, that's not a guy you're going to emulate. He also began stalking Jodie Foster, even moving to New Haven, Connecticut, where she was attending Yale. Although he never approached the actress, he did write her numerous letters and poems. But when these failed to make an impression, he decided he needed to do something more drastic to impress her. Assassinate the president. Like, you know what? Go big or go home, I suppose. During the trial, Hinckley's only real chance to avoid prison time was the insanity defence, and both sides argued in their favour. The defence diagnosed him with schizophrenia, while the prosecution argued that his actions were clearly premeditated and came from a sound mind. After much deliberation, the jury found Hinckley not guilty by reason of insanity. He was institutionalised for almost 35 years before being released in 2016. The verdict caused a huge uproar in America and actually brought in the Insanity Defence Reform Act of 1984, which made it much harder for the defence to be used during trials, which some states actually abolished altogether. 
Number one, Daniel McNaughton. We finally arrived at the guy who started it all, at least in modern times, Daniel McNaughton, a Scottish woodworker who tried to assassinate the British Prime Minister Robert Peel in 1843 and ended up killing Peel's personal secretary Edward Drummond instead. McNaughton had developed a paranoid delusion that he was being persecuted by the Tory party because he voted for the opposition. His police statement after shooting Drummond said as much, and it said in part, and I quote, The Tories in my native city have compelled me to do this. They follow and persecute me wherever I go and have entirely destroyed my peace of mind. They followed me to France, into Scotland and all over England. In fact, they follow me wherever I go. I cannot sleep. I can get no rest from them. I believe they have driven me into consumption. I am sure I shall never be the man I once was. I have used good health and strength, but I have not now. They have accused me of crimes of which I am not guilty. In fact, they wish to murder me. It can be proved by evidence. That's all I have to say. And just... Okay. Very impassioned speech there. McNaughton's legal team argued that their client had a case of monomania, an insane fixation on a certain issue or persons, and that it was so severe that it eradicated his ability to tell right from wrong. The prosecution brought in two doctors of their own, but they also concluded that McNaughton was insane, and therefore the jury found him to be not guilty by reason of insanity. This ended up setting a legal precedent in British law history and the appearance of the McNaughton rule, which stated that in order for a defendant to use the insanity defence, it must be proved that they were acting under the defect of a reason caused by a disease of the mind, which meant that they're not understanding the nature of their actions or what they were doing was wrong. So yeah, one guy started it all. So I hope everybody out there found this video entertaining, informative, and educational. I certainly found the script to be all three of those things. And if you enjoyed the video, why not give the author a like on social media, the links below, or follow me. While you're down there, as mentioned at the intro, you can like the video, comment on the video with feedback, suggestions for more things to do in future, or subscribe for more content like this. And as I always like to say to everybody watching, to the end, have the day you all deserve. Cheers.